Good afternoon, class. This is College Algebra Practice Test Number Two, covering Module Two, Chapters Three and Four. Chapter Three, Functions. Chapter Four, Linear Functions. And this is Chapter Three, Functions. Let's look at some definitions: dependent and independent variables. And you have an equation in the form of, of y as a function of x. If the value of y depends on the value of x, then y is the dependent variable and x is the independent one. So here's the definition of a relation, a set of ordered pairs, domain, the set of all inputs. In short, all possible values of x, you can see it here, all possible values of x. Whereas range is the set of all outputs, dependent variable, all possible values of normally y. A function is a relation in which each element in the domain corresponds to exactly one element in the range. And therefore we use a VLT, vertical line test. If a vertical line can be drawn so that it intersects a graph at more than one point, then the graph doesn't represent a function. Otherwise it is a function. And we also have a one-to-one -one function. In short, a one-to-one -one is the type of function that not only x cannot repeat, the y cannot repeat either. In other words, a function is one-to-one -one if each element in the range corresponds to exactly one element in the domain. And we use a horizontal line just to check that. If a horizontal line can be drawn so that the, it intersects the graph of a function more than one point, the graph is not a one-to-one -one function. What we see at top here is short for DQ stands for the difference quotient, which is the average rate of change of y with respect to x. There are various ways of representing that. So having said that, we want to find the domain in this case. And we have three different functions. The first one is a rational function. A rational function is defined everywhere except what makes the denominator zero. So let's set it equal to zero and we're gonna exclude that. So X can be any number except one half. So to represent that, this is a short time notation, but in an interval format from negative infinity to one half, union one half to infinity, parentheses or excluding the end point, namely one half with negative and positive infinity, we always use parentheses. Um, when you're looking at a square root, what's underneath when the index is even must be non-negative. So larger than or equal to zero, you take the four to the other side, becomes minus four divided by five. So <clears throat> here's your answer. In an interval format, from negative four fits to infinity. Uh, this is a polynomial of degree two or a quadratic function. Therefore, the answer is all real numbers. A quadratic function or a polynomial of degree two. Uh, in this case, it's all real numbers. And the reason why is because the index is odd. When the index is odd, then there is no restrictions. For example, cube root of eight is two, cube root of negative eight is negative two. So we don't have any restrictions. Uh, this one, again, it's a rational function. We follow the same format. We set the denominator equal to zero. This is X equals plus minus one. We exclude X equals plus minus one. So this is a shorthand notation. And as far as interval notation is concerned, from negative infinity to negative one, union negative one to one, union one to infinity. Notice all the end points, they take parentheses. And you always go from small to large. This is a linear function and the domain is all real numbers and the notation is either R or negative infinity to positive infinity because it's a linear function. The domain is all real numbers. You wanna see if we are dealing with a uh, function 
or a one-to-one -one function, and we want to find the domain and range. So this one is a function, the reason why, and it's also a one-to-one -one function because it passes a vertical line test and it passes a horizontal line test. So is it a function? Yes. Is the one-to-one -one function? Yes. What is the domain? Domain along the x-axis is from two to eight. Is two included? No. Is eight included? Yes. Along the y-axis from six to eight and eight has a whole, eight is not included. And therefore pay attention to the way you write it. Parentheses two to infinite to eight for the domain for the range bracket six and parentheses come after eight. Be very careful with that. And for part B, is this a function? Yes, it does pass a vertical line test. Is it a one-to-one -one function? Clearly no. So function, yes, one-to-one -one function, no. What is the domain along the x-axis? I hope you realize that this will cover anywhere from here to here. So from negative three to two, two is not included. And the range covers anywhere from down here all the way to here, which is from negative five to positive four. The last one, is this a function? No. Is this a one-to-one -one function? No. It fails a vertical line test. It also fails a horizontal line test. What is the domain? So bring it down here, one, two, three, four. So the domain is from here to here, gives you negative four to zero. One, two, three, four. From zero to four is the range. Domain, range. Given the function, we want to find f of x plus h minus f of x over h known as difference quotient. So the terminology is, this is called the difference quotient and there are various ways of representing it. In short, is the average rate of change of y with respect to x. So take a look at what that means. The difference quotient is called the average rate of change of y with respect to x over the interval of x sub one to x sub two and can be interpreted as the slope of a secant line. If you pick up two points on a curve and draw a line, the blue line, that is a secant line. Now, the way you represent points, you can say this is x of one, therefore this becomes p of x of one uh, and f of x of one. If you go with this one, x of two and f of x of two. If you say this is a, this becomes, and the distance of h, this is a plus h. So this is a point at a f of a and q at a plus h and f of a plus h. The point I'm trying to make. This is ultimately the good old y sub two minus y sub one over x sub two minus x sub one. What are these? Different representation of the same thing. So uh, we want to evaluate this. So replace the x with x plus h, plug it in, and then minus f of x. So this becomes two times x plus h plus one. That's this one, and the, the rest is very obvious. So two times x plus h plus one minus two x plus one. When you distribute, you get two x plus two h plus one minus two x minus one. And therefore, I can drop the two x and minus two x. I can also drop the plus one and negative one. I end up with two h in the numerator divided by h gives me two. We are given f of x as 2x squared plus 1. 
we are given g of x as three x minus five, and we want to find f of g of two. So a quick reminder, f plus minus g of x, that means f of x plus g of x or f of x minus g of x, those are called the sum and difference uh, functions. f times g, simply put f of x times g of x, f over g would be f of x over g of x, where the denominator can't be zero. We also have the composite function, f of g, that means f of g of x, g o f means g of f of x. And uh, now we're gonna look at f of g of two. And by the way, this explains about the domain, domain of f of g versus domain of f or domain of g. With that being the case, f of g of two, that means first we need to find g of two. So here's the g function and we want to plug in two. So let's find g of two, which is three times two minus five equals one. And now, so f of g of two, that means f of one. So f of one, now put one into this, two times one squared plus one gives us number three. f of g of x. Well, look at the f function and replace anywhere you see x replace it with the g function. Of course, this can be simplified. I hope you remember a minus b squared is a squared minus two ab plus b squared. So this becomes nine x squared minus two times three x times uh, five becomes minus 30 x and 25. So this going from here to here, quick reminder, a plus b squared is a squared plus two ab plus b squared. Now we are going to distribute the two and we get 18x squared minus 60x plus 50. Now we're gonna add the one to 50 and it gives us 51. Everything else remains unchanged. F of G of X, where X represents the domain of G and G of X represents the domain of F. And it becomes the domain of F of G. Given the function f of x equals 2x squared plus 1 and gx equals 3x minus 1, we want to find the following. We are going to continue to look at more examples. We looked at f of g, now we want to look at g of f, which means go to the g function, replace the x with the f function. We do that. And now we have to distribute. So 3 times 2x squared is six x squared, let me just write that for you. Uh, six x squared plus three, and we add it with minus five, we get negative two. G or G, that means the G function replace the x with the g function. So three times x minus five becomes three times three x minus five minus five. That's the meaning of g o g. And again, we do nine x minus 15 with minus five, we get minus 20. Uh, we're going to continue. We're going to look at f o f of negative two by definition means f of f of negative two, which means we put negative two into the f function first. So two times minus two quantity squared plus one, and this is positive four times two eight and one they add up to nine. 
So we want f of nine. So f of nine, replace the x with nine. So nine squared, it's 81 times two plus one. So that is 162, add one, you get 163. Now, uh, we want to see what's an even function. We are interested to see if the function f of x and g of x are even or odd. Therefore, I'm reminding you of the definition of even odd. Even function is where f of minus x is the same as f of x, and it's symmetric with respect to the y-axis if you go to graph it. On the other hand, the odd function f of minus x is minus f of x. And if you were to graph, it would be symmetric. The two would be symmetric with respect to the origin. So basically, you want to determine what's going on. You have to replace the x with negative x and see what happens. So f of minus x is that. I hope you realize this is the same as x squared. So two times that is 2x squared plus 1. This is identical to f of x. By this definition, makes this an even function. Let's do the same thing with the g. We are going to evaluate g of negative x. And when we do that, we get minus 3x minus 5. This is not equal to g of x. Therefore, it's not even. This is not equal to minus g of x. Therefore, it's not odd either. G of X is neither even nor odd. Uh, we want to look at graphing techniques in a moment. So let's look at this uh, average rate of change. Uh, where G of X is 3X, we want to go from negative 1 to 1. And it was already defined. It's uh, the concept of a difference quotient. So basically, f of, uh, in this case, g of uh, b uh, minus g of a over b minus a, or f of x sub 2 minus f of x sub 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1. So plug in and evaluate it just as you would here. Um, writing f in general, but this happened to be g everybody, okay? So uh, g of 1, in essence, for this question, we really should pay attention to that. That really means g, if you will. So g of 1 minus g of negative one. And when you evaluate it at one, you get three times one. Minus when you evaluate at negative one, you get negative three times uh, negative one. This negative makes this positive. So three plus three is six. And the bottom is one plus one or two and the ratio is three. The next one is f of x is two x minus nine, and we wanna do the same thing from four to eight. So we plug in a, so that we basically follow this formula. We plug in the a minus, we plug in the four over a minus four. So the second one is plugged in first. Now, what is f of a? This is two times a minus nine. What is f of four? Two times four minus nine, okay? And so this is eight minus nine, giving us negative one. So I hope you see that we have two a minus nine, plus one, which makes it two a minus eight. If you factor out the a minus four from the numerator, <clears throat> then they cancel each other and they give us two. This is the final answer. How about this function? h of x is going to be 3x plus 4, moving from 2 to 2 plus h. So in essence, it looks like this. I want you to know that. So plug in 2 plus h for the numerator. Plug in 2 plus h minus plug in 2. 
for the denominator is two plus h minus two, which becomes h. That's why it becomes h. And you need that in upcoming courses. So obviously the denominator becomes h as you can see. But what is f of two plus h? Let's plug in three times two plus h plus four. Minus f of two, if you plug in two, you get three times two plus four. So let's uh, simplify. Okay, so this is six plus three H plus four minus, I hope you see this is 10 and six and four, they add up to 10, they cancel out the negative 10. So we have three H in the numerator and the final answer is three because we can cancel out each. Next, we wanna look at graphing techniques. I'm gonna quickly remind you of what we have seen. The concept of a translation. If you're given the function y equals f of x, when we say y equals f of x plus c, that shifts it up by c, we are assuming c is positive f of x minus c brings it down by c, f of x minus c moves it to the right, f of x plus c moves it to the left. Again, we are going back to this y equals f of uh, x. If we multiply it by c, it makes the y coordinate larger by a factor of c, assuming c is larger than one. And let's say c is five, then uh, five times, okay? For the same x coordinate, the y is five times and one over five, that means you divide the y coordinate by five. Um, f of, uh, here's again f of x, f of minus x, you change the x to minus x, assuming x is positive, then it flips over with respect to the y axis. So I hope it's clear what happens. On the other hand, if you put the negative in front of the function minus five x, it flips it over with respect to the x axis. Uh, uh, so we have the following uh, function and uh, we want to apply transformation to a toolkit function, essential functions, write the equation of the function that matches the graph. Uh, you have to know the general shape of any elementary function. Class, when we say elementary or toolkit or essential function, something like f of x equals a constant, f of x equals x, x squared, x cubed, square root of x, cube root of x. You should know all, all of them. So f of x equals b, it's a horizontal line. f of x equals x or y equals x is a line that goes through the origin. y equals x squared looks like that. y equals x cubed looks like that. Here's y equals square root of x and here's cube root of x. You have to know the general shape if you wanna be comfortable moving on. So we also have this function called an absolute value function, which looks like a V shape. It looks like a V as you can see, and it has its vertex, we call it, at zero, zero. So it's an absolute value with a vertex at zero, zero. Now, when we look at the new one, look at the vertex, it has moved to a new location, three comma negative two. So basically we are shifting it to the right. So plus, when we go to the right, by plus three, we subtract it. So we write X minus three, it's going with a negative two, so it's going down, minus two. And what is in front, we don't know. We just looked at the location of a vertex because this may be one, may not be, we have no idea, we have to figure it out. How do we figure it out? You can pick any other pair and plug in to figure out A and always use the easy ones. Obviously, this point has coordinates zero, one, this co point has uh, coordinates, one, zero, and both are easy to use. And it doesn't matter which one you use. So let's say we are going to use the first one. 
which means we are going to replace the y with zero and x with one. As you know, one minus three is negative two. Absolute value makes it positive two. So we have two a minus two equals zero, which makes a one replace it. And here's the final answer. So a quick recap for a case like this. First and foremost, look at the, you should know the general shape. It's a V shape, an absolute value. It is still the same V shape. So you look at the location of a vertex and put that in here accordingly, but you have to put something here, some value such as A, because you don't know what's happening to that. Maybe positive, maybe negative, maybe larger than one, maybe smaller than one. And then how do you arrive at it? Pick up easy points, points that you can easily read, and find out the value of it. And by the way, we used this pair. Now you can use this pair on this to make sure this makes sense. In other words, you can check your one. Uh, so again, we have a similar situation. In this case, we are given this function and we wanna see um, what the equation is. Obviously it looks like the square root of x, similar to square root of x, and you should, that's why you should know that. So uh, what happens is that you notice that the intercept, the uh, x and y intercept are located at zero, zero, and this has shifted to this new position. Which is negative three, negative one. This is a new position. So what does it mean? Negative three, that means add a positive three here, negative one, that means negative one here. And by the way, uh, you can still use A in front here, but I think it was that was pretty uh, um, clear that is the case. However, you must check. So again, you can put the A and check. How do you check it? For example, this is an easy point. Notice this check point negative two zero, plug it in here, it works. And again, if you have any doubts, you can write, uh, you can write this as such and then plug this in to find A, okay? So, or uh, if you think it's that easy, you can see the answer, you can just check it with a point or even two points just to be on the safe side. Here's another example we wanna figure out. And we know the basic function y equals x squared and how it looks like. So uh, we have a vertex located at uh, zero, zero, another, vertex has moved here, giving us negative one, positive two. So the good old vertex of zero, zero has been moved here. So y equals a times x minus h quantity squared plus k. I hope you remember this formula. We are going to go with y equals a times x plus one quantity squared plus two. We're gonna replace that, okay? And this is good enough. Now, all you need is pick a pair, any easy point. It's important that you pick an easy pair. So obviously this is an easy point, zero comma one. Uh, that means replace the X with zero, evaluate it, it must be equal to one. So when you do that, this becomes one squared one, A plus two is one, A plus two is one. And so A becomes negative one, Plug it in and you're done. Plug it in and uh, you're done. And as always, anytime you come up with the answer, you're more than welcome to check with uh, one or two more points to be on the safe side. Uh, we want to find the equation of a function that is finally graphed after we do the transformation to this function. So the function is y equals uh, x squared. We want to shift it right by three units. So this becomes x minus three quantity squared. Going back to the function. We want to 
now, now going back to this function, my apologies. We want to reflect the result about the x-axis. And so you put a negative sign in front of the function y that is from here, in, right in here. And then you want to shift it down by two units. So you want to shift this down by two units, go down by two units, that means minus two. Uh, let's go over the definition of extrema. Extrema is a plural for extremum, okay? Absolute or gl global extreme values or extrema are either maximum or minimum points on a curve. Extrema is the plural of the Latin extrema. So absolute mean occurs at the point C where f of C is less than or equal to f of x for all x values in the domain. In other words, if you look at this graph, first of all, peaks and values, local mean, local max, local mean. This one, there is no other point having a smaller y coordinate. Therefore, this is an absolute. Absolute max is the other way around as far as the definition. Here's at the point, if f of c is larger than or equal to f of x for all x values. So take a look at this one. Peaks and values, local max, local mean, local max. This local max is also an absolute max. Relative or local extrema. A local minimum is the minimum value within some open interval. Local minimum occurs at a point C in an open interval of A to B in the domain F of C less than or equal to F of X for all X values in the open interval. So as you can see, peaks and values, local mean, local max, and none of them is absolute. And uh, a local max, in it's the other definition, occurs at a point C in an open interval of A to B in the domain if F of C larger than or equal to F of X for all X values in the open interval, local mean, local max. Uh, what I need to add is this. Extreme value theorem, if F is a continuous function whose domain is a closed interval, then F has an absolute max as well as absolute mean in the interval of A to B. The reason why this is closed. So if you have a, happen to have a continuous function, either in the interior uh, of the interval, you have an absolute max or mean or the end points. By the way, the end points can ever never be local extreme. Of, they can only be absolute if that. Um, we want to estimate the interval where the function is increasing or decreasing. First, I want to quickly give you the definition of those. A function is increasing on an open interval if for any choice of x sub 1 and x sub 2, with x sub 1 less than x sub 2, we have f of x sub 1 less than f of x sub 2. In other words, as x get lar gets larger, y gets larger. This is the meaning of increasing. But the decreasing is the other way around. The function is decreasing on an open interval of i. If for any choice of x sub one and x sub two in i, with x sub one less than x sub two, we have f of x sub one larger than f of x sub two. In other words, if x gets larger, y gets smaller. So as we go from left to right, in both cases, x gets larger. If y gets larger also, it's increasing. A simple example for a linear function would be when we have a positive slope. On the other hand, in the case of a linear function, when we have a negative slope, it's decreasing because as we go from left to right, although x increases, the y decreases. And of course, a constant is the one that all the y values are equal. So uh, let's see where this function is increasing. Okay, the function is increasing here and increasing here and it's decreasing here. And here's how we write that. Increasing from negative eight Take a look at along the x-axis. This corresponds to negative eight, this corresponds to negative three. 
and this corresponds to three, this corresponds to seven, minus eight, minus three, union three to seven, and the rest of it, that means from negative three to three along the x-axis is decreasing. Now, what I wanna add, normally we don't consider the end points as part of increasing, decreasing, because we don't know what happens immediately after. That's why at the end, we normally use parentheses. Some text, they do use brackets, but the proper way of writing it is with parentheses when it comes to increasing, decreasing. Determine any local max or mean. Well, here's the local max, here's the local mean, and let's see how we do write it. This is a local max. So local max equals to the y coordinate, 50, at x equals negative three, and we write it as a pair. It's very important that you understand that and you write it in the same fashion and answer the question accordingly. So what is the local max is the y coordinate of the function. At what point? At this pair. On the other hand, the local mean is this one. The y coordinate is negative 50. So local mean equals minus 50, the y coordinate at three comma negative 50. Now, what about the absolute max? It so happened the end points are the absolute max and absolute mean. Here's the absolute max. So absolute max is equal to the y coordinate of this point 150 at 7, 150. And absolute mean is at this point equals negative 225 or so at this pair, negative 8, comma, negative 225. So uh, extrema refer to the y coordinate of the function. Remember that and you'll be fine. We want to find the inverse function. So the process is very simple. We have a few steps. Number one, interchange X and Y. So to do that, we're going to change this to Y because it's easier to deal with it when we call it Y instead of F of X. Now we're going to interchange X and Y. And right here we have the inverse. However, we solve for y. That means I'm going to move the negative 7. I make this x plus 7. And then I'm going to divide by 2. This is the answer. We change this to f inverse. Now, you really have to look at the composite function. f or f inverse becomes x. And I leave it for you to show that. For this one, we go through the same process. Number one, we change this to y because it's easier to deal with. Now we're gonna interchange x and y. So wherever we see y, we change it to x, x, we change it to y. And this is the inverse, but we have to solve for y. So we do the cross product, x times y, x times two equals y. We move the y. Either we go this way or that way. So if we go that way, minus x, y, divide uh, by coefficient of y, you have to factor y times one minus x, divide by one minus x, both sides. This is your answer. We call it f inverse. And by the way, uh, this is the answer. If we had moved this differently, then we could have got this one negative and this one positive, okay? So please understand these two are identical. Right here, the way we moved it, if we moved it uh, right here, actually right here, not this one. would result in this. Again, you have to show in both cases class, you have to show f or f inverse or f inverse or f equals x. That's uh, when we show two, if we want to show two functions are inverse of each other. 
use a function composition to verify that these two are inverse functions. Now, uh, it's important to know we don't have to take the inverse of this, although if you take the inverse of this, we get to this and that's fine. But finding f of f inverse, it's an easier way to verify that. So f of f inverse, we're going to replace this x with x cubed plus 1. Now, this one comes out as x cubed plus 1 minus 1. They cancel each other, cube root of x cube, which is x. And you're done. You don't have to show f inverse or f equals x. But for practice, I want to show you that. Look at f inverse of. That means we can show, in this case, we can show that if we replace the x with this, also we get to the answer. So um, the two functions, normally we call this g of x, by the way. Uh, in this case, because we don't know it's an inverse yet, we have to show it. So if you replace this here, here's what you get. Cube root of x minus one to the third power. They cancel each other and we get x minus one out. This minus one, this cancels out this plus one and the answer is x. Okay. We want to uh, sketch the uh, inverse function. To do that, remember that the graphs are symmetric with respect to the line y equals x. And all you have to do, pick up a few points from one graph and you can see the uh, corresponding points. For example, in general, if a comma b is a pair on the graph of f of x. Then b comma a is on the graph of f inverse of x. By the way, this means an element of, you may have seen it in set theory. All right, so with that being the case, draw a line y equals x and reflect the graph uh, on the line. And to do that, first notice a few easy pairs. F of minus two is negative four. F of minus two is negative four. We are looking at this point on the graph of the red one. Current, so change, interchange X and Y. So F inverse of negative four is negative two. So this means the pair negative two, four. This means the pair negative four, negative two. So corresponding to that here. So let me write it at top of it. This means the pair negative two, four is part of the F function. And this means, this is negative four. Negative four, negative two is on its inverse. Another easy one, f of zero equals four. Notice f of zero equals uh, four. So f of zero equals four. So f inverse of four equals zero, meaning this belongs to the f function, the red function. This belongs to its inverse. And so if you graph this, you can easily see the line y equals x, and you can see those pairs as well as those pairs. And if need be, you can also use more pairs. So using the fact that it's symmetric with respect to the line y equals x, and you can interchange x and y, you can pick up a few points, connect them, you're done. You can even pick like 10 points on the graph of the red function. And corresponding to that, remember this. Uh, we want to uh, graph this, uh, which is known as a piecewise defined function. We have three pieces. The first one is just y equals negative x plus one. 
from negative one to one, uh, which is a linear function and you graph it. The next one is um, just two at x equals one. It's just the pair, okay? The pair has coordinates one comma two. And then as x gets larger than one, it becomes a quadratic function y equals x squared. So let's graph all three and then see what happens. First, this is y equals negative x plus one. By the way, you can pick up points. To pick up points, pick up negative one on anything smaller than that, negative one. Plug it into this, that gives you two. If you uh, plug in zero, that gives you one. Uh, one is right here and then Larger than that, you plug it in here. Two gives you four, three gives you nine, and you can pick more. So all you have to do, pick up those and graph them. So take a look at what I want to explain to you. So this function, y equals, let me write it next to it. So I would graph them in one shot. So I'm, this line has the equation y equals minus x plus one, okay? This, is the function y equals x squared. Now, remember what we want. We wanna go back and pay attention to the restriction. The restriction says we go from negative one to one. So you wanna find the negative one, which is here, all the way to one, but the one doesn't have equality. So only this portion and this is the whole. Then look at the next one, two comma one. So and my apologies, is one comma two, X is one. So one comma two somewhere here. Then what about this graph? If you look at the last one says, when X is larger than one is this graph. So find one and put a hole there and only this portion is good. So in other words, let me see if I can use a different color here. So this one is uh, because of the equality, okay? So negative one gives us two, so this point is good. And then one, so we come on down. This portion is good. And this one is less than, so you put a hole here. Then we have this pair or this pair, one comma two, this point. And then from one on, is it different? No, I can use the same color. Put a hole here. This is the portion, and that's your graph. Pay attention to the holes and where we put it. Now, what is the domain and range? Domain goes from negative one to infinity. Actually, it shows it right here. Negative one to infinity, and you can see that. And the range goes from zero to infinity because it starts from here, but we have a hole here. I hope you see that there's a hole. So all the way up, everything is fine, except the zero. We're gonna continue with the average rate of change for this function, f of x, x squared minus three x, we're gonna go from two to four. So basically means this, plug in four minus plug in two over four minus two. So f of b, any of those you want to write, f of b minus f of a over b minus a for this one would be f of four minus f of two over four minus. Two. I'm going to assume everybody knows what to do. Plug in four, plug in two. When we plug in four, we get four squared, which is 16, minus three times four, which is 20. When we plug in two, we get two squared, which is four, 
minus three times two, which is six. And this is four. And this is negative two. So minus negative two makes it positive two, six over two, which is three. Now, uh, when we want to go from four to four plus h, and this becomes extremely important in upcoming courses like calculus, just plug in four plus h, and then plug in four, and the denominator becomes four plus h minus four, which becomes h. And h is a minute number. So uh, replace the x with four plus h. and then with four. So four plus h squared minus three times four plus h minus four squared minus three times four. Now you have to uh, do the math. This is a plus b squared. So this is 16 plus eight h plus h squared minus 12 minus three h. Four squared is 16 minus 12 is four. So minus four or just minus 16 plus 12. And I hope uh, you see that a lot of things cancel out. Uh, 16 cancels out negative 16. Negative 12 cancels out negative 12. 8H and negative 3H, they add up to 5H and H squared also is there. So h squared plus 5h. We can factor out the h from the numerator. And we drop the h. And we end up with 5 plus h as the final answer. We're going to continue on that thoughts. Uh, the next section, the next uh, chapter is about linear functions. So. Uh, we want to find the value of x if a linear function goes through the following points and has the following slope. So we have the pairs, we have the slope. So I want to quickly remind you of what we have learned in this chapter lines. Standard form ax plus b y equals c. Slope intercept form y equals mx plus b. Point slope y minus y1 equals m times x minus x sub y. Any vertical line is in the form of x equals a. Slope is undefined. X intercept takes place at a comma z. Any horizontal line, h l. Y equals a constant b. Slope is zero. Y intercept at zero b. Two lines are considered parallel if they have equal slopes. Different y intercepts. Perpendicular if their slopes are negative reciprocal of each other or their product is negative one. So with that being the case, we are going to use this formula, the uh, slope formula y sub two minus y sub one over x sub two minus x sub one, rise over run. So we can say six minus two over minus four minus x. And we know it to be equal to three. So now we do the cross product three times minus four times minus x uh, equals six minus two is four. So we distribute the three, we get negative 12 minus three x. Now, if I move this to the other side, it becomes positive 12, which is 16. And we're going to divide it by negative three, and that's the value of x we are looking for. A town has an initial population of 75,000. It grows at a constant rate of 2,500 per year. That means it's really the slope. Find the linear function that models the town's population as a function of the year. Uh, pay attention to the fact that it's a linear function. So y equals mx plus b. 
And of course, we're going to use P, where T is the number of years since the model uh, began. So we are dealing with the Y intercept of 75,000. In this case, because it's population, we can say the P intercept. So Y equals MX plus B. We are going, going to use P equals MT plus B. M is the slope. Instead of X, we're going to use T. The variable is years. That's Y and B. So in short, 75,000 is a constant and 2,500 per year. So M is 2,500. So say explanation, P of T is the population as a function of time. M is the constant rate of growth of the function. In this case, it's 2,500 per year. T is the time elapsed in units of years. B is the initial population, which happened to be 75,000. So the linear function becomes 2,500 T plus 75,000. Uh, here's uh, an interesting example. Monthly cost of a cellular plan depends on the number of minutes used and a flat T. So if we use 410 minutes, they charge us 7150. If we use 720 minutes, they charge us 118. We want to find a linear function for the cost. So first and foremost class, uh, we normally use X and Y. In this case, we're going to use X and C. C representing the cost. C depends on X. C is really replacing the Y. So it's important that you write the pair so you know how to represent this. The independent variable X or T is 410 minutes, 7150, so on and so forth. So you have two pairs. Find the slope. M is changing Y over changing X. Now, instead of Y, we're going to put C sub 2 minus C sub 1. OK, everybody? Because it's a cost. So in this case, 118 minus 7150 over 720 minus 410. You uh, simplify this, and it becomes 3 over 20, or you can say 0. 15, because it's uh, money, we can write it as a decimal with two decimals. Then you remember y minus y1 equals m times x minus x sub 1. So instead of y minus, let me put that at the top of it. So to refresh your memory, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x sub 1. Now we're going to use c instead of that. And we use one of those two pairs. So for example, if we use this one, C minus 118 is a three over 20 or 0.15, either one times X minus 720. If we write it in this fashion, it becomes a tad easier to calculate and we write both of them. So C minus one, so we're gonna uh, um, distribute the three over 20 over the parentheses, we get three over 20 times X and then three, to over, uh, three over 20 minus 720. Uh, gives us uh, 10 And so when we distribute 3 over 20 and do the math, this becomes 108. And we can add 118. We get C equals 3 over 20 times X plus 10. Uh, in the case of part B, if X is 687, replace the X with 687. And again, you can write it as 0.15 or 3 over 20. 
multiply, add the 10, and that gives you the cost. And normally, in the case of the money, we want to use two decimals, 113.05. Uh, finally, we want to do the interpretation of the slope and a, a C intercept. The C intercept represents the fixed monthly cost, flat fee charged by company. So they charge us 10 bucks. The slope represents the change in cost per minute of call for the amount of 15 cents per minute. So if we for example, use only one minute, we pay $10.15. If we use it for 10 minutes, we do, they charge us 1.5 plus 10, 11.5. The height in inches of a sunflower X weeks after being planted can be approximated by the following function, f of x is 6x minus 1 fourth x squared. How tall is it after planting? How much? Eight weeks after planting. So this is elementary algebra. Replace the x with eight. We want f of eight. And we work it out. Of course, eight squared is 64. And, and we end up with 32, the units, inches. Uh, find the average rate of growth uh, from week six to week 12. That means f of x of two minus f of x of one over x of two minus x of one, and x of one is six, x of two is 12. So, uh, this is a simple calculation, elementary algebra, plug in 12, plug in six, and the denominator is simply 12 minus six. Uh, everybody can do this calculation. I leave it for you to finish the job. This is obviously 144. So when you finish the job, it becomes three halves of an inch. So, what is the average rate of growth from the end of week six to end of week 12 is three half, three halves and an inch per week, per week. That's the meaning of it. Uh, this is question 19 from module one. So recall a fitness club charges 20 bucks as a monthly access fee and two bucks per day. Express the monthly cost in terms of daily usage. Well, if you let X or T represent the number of days, then Y equals MX plus B. $20 is the fixed cost, that's B, and $2 is the slope, so 2x plus 20. What will be the monthly cost after 15 days? Replace the x with 15, and we end up with 2 times 15, which is 30 plus 20 equals 50 bucks. <laughs>